a couple of years ago, my wife and I were having dinner with some friends, and the conversation around the table got on to space flight and medicine. And so one of our guests asked me, knowing that I'd been back on Earth uh, for a few years after my last flight, if I had returned to normal. And I said, yes, I've returned to, to normal. Well, my wife interjected. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 no. You have not returned to no normal. Psychologically, she said, you are still up there in space. You've never returned. So uh, we all laughed. And uh, what I meant when I replied to our guest that I returned to normal was from a physiological perspective. I had regained the aerobic capacity, I had regained the muscle strength, I had regained the, the bone mineral density that I'd lost during flight. And my body, more or less, had returned to its pre-flight state. But my wife was correct, psychologically, um, I was still up there in space. And a lot of my priorities, a lot of my perspectives had changed such that what I considered signal versus noise in the past had changed to a post-flight state. So let me explain what I, I meant by that. The first way that space changed me was an appreciation for the glorious beauty of the planet that we live on. I remember our, my first view of Earth from space. Uh, we had just launched to space aboard the space shuttle Columbia about 10 minutes uh, into the orbit, and someone tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked out the window, and this is what I saw. It was the Atlantic Ocean, and the sun was glinting off of the blue waters of the ocean. Beyond the ocean was the curve of the Earth's horizon, and then beyond the horizon was nothing but empty, black, inky space. It was surreal. It was totally different than anything I'd experienced in a simulator, anything that I'd viewed in a, a book or a film, and the view sent a chill up my spine that I never forgot. And thereafter, uh, whenever I had time, on subsequent days. My favorite activity was just to float near a window and look down at this beautiful planet down below. So deserts come in a hundred shades of brown, a hundred shades of yellow, a hundred shades of orange, a hundred shades of, of red. A thunderstorm is a powerful phenomenon to observe from up above. And viewed from up above, mountain ranges, erupting volcanoes, Ocean reefs are mesmerizingly majestic. The other thing I, I saw when I looked, gazed out the window, I gained an appreciation for the myriad of interconnections that exist in our natural uh, ecosystem down below. So, for example, forest fires in Siberia track all the way, halfway across the world and impact the quality of air in North America. A small Atmospheric depression in the Atlantic Ocean develops into a Category 4 hurricane and wreaks havoc in the lives of the citizens that live along the Gulf Coast. Overnight, the price of gasoline goes up 30 cents per liter in my hometown, which is half a continent away. And what I began to appreciate is that Earth's natural ecosystem features multifaceted interconnections between the land in the ocean, in the atmosphere, in the freshwater cycle, in the flora, in the fauna, and a small disturbance on one part of the natural ecosystem can have an effect on the other side of the, of the planet. But ecosystems are elsewhere, they're everywhere, and they're beyond nature. They permeate our society, they permeate our lives. So for example, think about the human body. The failure of the beta cells in our pancreas can put patients at significant risk for disease involving the nerves, the eyes, the teeth, the heart, the small blood vessels, and even the kidneys. All because a tiny, tiny group of cells in the body no longer produces insulin. Another ecosystem is the financial world, which features complex relationships between bankers, consumers, governments, shareholders, regulators. And back in 2008, the collapse of the Lehman Brothers uh, kicked off a perfect storm of ensuing events that rippled outward and almost brought down our financial empire in the, in the earth. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, there's an indigenous nation, and they're the Nuchalnuth, and they believe in a holistic relationship between the physical world and the spiritual world. And they have a, a saying that they hold on to, Hishuk Ish Sowak, which when you translate it, it means 
Everything is one. We are all connected. Everything is one. We are all connected. In other words, they perceive that the universe is an intricate and an orderly whole. And things that happen in one part of this whole impact and are connected to many other systems throughout our planet, throughout society, throughout our, our lives. But looking down at the earth with the passage of time and space, when days became weeks and weeks became months, I began to perceive some of the small details down on the planetary surface below. And that really impressed me with the fragility and the vulnerability of our planet. And it also uh, impressed me with the impact that human activity is having on our planet as well. So, for example, off the east coast of Africa, there's an island nation called Madagascar. And Madagascar is suffering from catastrophic loss of topsoil. So, the unregulated removal of forest, native forest from Madagascar, over the last 50 or 100 years for pasture land, for cultivation purposes, has resulted in massive erosion. So massive loads of topsoil are coming off the denuded mountainsides into the river valleys below, choking off the river. And then with the river outflow, all of this life-sustaining, valuable topsoil is leaving and vanishing from Madagascar forever. So you say, well, Bob, you know, this is the 21st century. What happened 50 or 100 years ago uh, is the past. Certainly, we're smarter today. We're wiser. We understand the concept of sustainability. This would never happen again, right? Wrong. So this is a photo that I took of the Brazilian rainforest. Whenever we pass over the Amazon, I would see tens of brush fires with their smoky poles coming up into the atmosphere and then being transferred halfway across the Atlantic Ocean towards Africa. So the same deforestation that happened 50 years ago in Madagascar is happening today in the Amazon. One particular Brazilian state, known as Rondonia, is particularly bad hit. And there is more area now of clear cut than there is of uh, remaining rainforest canopy. And this is tragic, not just for the Brazilians, but it's tragic for all of us, because the Amazon rainforest are the lungs. They affect the, the quality of the entire atmosphere of the entire planet. So today was a clear day in Calgary. And I looked up, and I saw a clear blue prairie sky, 360 degrees around me, blue, 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 blue. And if you're thinking that uh, we have one resource on Earth that's plentiful, it's got to be our atmosphere. Well, viewed from space, that's not the case. All that we have that protects us from the harsh environment of space is a sheer veil of atmosphere that envelops our planet. So it protects us against hard vacuum, extremes of temperature, ultraviolet radiation, ionizing radiation. All that we have that sustains life on Earth is a sheer, thin veil of atmosphere. One of the um, delights for me during my first flight was recognizing that the nighttime view of the planet is every bit as awesome as the daytime view. It took me by surprise. And that's because of the aurora, and also because of city lights as well. City lights look like diamonds that are scattered on, on black velvet. And city lights are also helpful because they, they outline the coastline of a, of a country. And they can also give you a good impression of the economic prosperity of a country or of cities like, like Rome and Naples. Someone a long time ago said that from space, you can't see national borders. And this statement is a nice sentiment, and it's partially true in that, you know, there's no red line running along the boundary between neighboring countries. That doesn't exist. But when you fly over at nighttime regions of the world, you can certainly perceive which countries are doing well and which ones are not. So this is a, a view of East Asia at nighttime. In the lower right corner is the country of South Korea and the big uh, intensity of light, that's the capital city, Seoul. And in the top left, that's China, and you can appreciate some of the big cities in, in China as well. And what you probably think is that in between uh, South Korea and China, there's a waterway there, joining the Yellow Sea to the Sea of Japan. <sighs> it's not. It's North Korea. And in North Korea, it's a desolate blotch of darkness with no power, no heating, no lighting, for 25 million citizens. And as I overfly this country, 
I realize that the North Korean political leaders are misguided, and they neglect the economic plight of their country, and they ignore the standard of living of their citizens. The only spot of light there is the, the capital city of Pyongyang. It's, uh, it makes me feel regret for those societies that are repressed by harsh rule. But don't get me wrong, the experience of space flight is overwhelmingly positive. It engenders hope and, um, and promise of collaboration. Everything that I've achieved as an astronaut has been done on the basis of collaboration. Collaboration across cultures, across disciplines, across international boundaries. And even the view out the window helps to set that mindset of internationalization. So uh, you know that the International Space Station orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes. And every 90 minutes, I see a new panorama of, uh, of, of countries. So on one orbit, I'll pass over Honduras, and then Cuba, Ireland, uh, Britain, Central Europe, uh, the Middle East, the Persian Gulf. Then off we'll go and visit uh, Australia and New Zealand. And then a new global panorama starts with the start of the next uh, orbit, a new sequence of countries, a new palette of topographies. You know, a lot of the countries that prior to flight that I wasn't all that aware of suddenly dominate my daily view of the, of the planet. So I think about the countries, I think about the people that live there. Greece, the home of ancient home of civilization, uh, Sudan, South Sudan, with the ongoing civil strife there and the famine. And then I think of the Middle East, the birthplace of Judaism, Christianity, Islam. On my first week in space, I eagerly sought out my hometown. And when I found it, I, I called my crewmates over and I pointed out my, my hometown to them. The second week, I became aware of my continent. Then the third week and thereafter, I was only noticing one humanity. I felt predominantly a citizen of planet Earth. If you had asked me prior to my first flight aboard the station, what is the best thing about the International Space Station? I would have said that it is a unique research facility that allows us to do research you cannot possibly do on Earth. And if you asked me that same question after I flew on the ISS, then my answer is a little bit different. I still proclaim that the International Space Station is an R&D facility of no earthly peer. But I think today, the best thing about the International Space Station is it's international. It has brought together former adversarial nations under a common vision to extend the capability of humans and a desire to increase hope for humanity and to inspire the population to pursue audacious dreams. The International Space Station program has demonstrated that the visions that unite us are more important than the things that divide us, that we can overcome economic, political, social, cultural barriers to extend the reach of humanity, and that exploration is important, it's critical, that Earth is no more than a cradle for humanity, and that one day civilization will migrate out to interstellar destinations. I believe that the legacy, the enduring legacy of the ISS is going to be the international partnership. The blue marble is a photograph, an iconic photograph that was taken by the last crew of the Apollo mission series as they were venturing from uh, Earth to the moon back in the, the 1970s. Uh, it's iconic because it caused a consciousness shift in society. It, for the first time ever, we began to think about our planet as a precious blue planet in the setting of this uh, dark void of, of the universe. Well, the blue marble photo was also important because it helped to um, create a term that we call the overview effect. The term the overview effect is used by astronauts and by others to describe the spiritual feeling that comes over you when you look down and you see the planet Earth, that we're all connected and that we're all one, and that through international cooperation we can do things uh, that we can't do uh, alone. Well, let me show you one more photo that um, made a similar impact on me. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, we witnessed the end of the scientific mission of the Cassini space probe. And over 13 years, Cassini took 450,000 images of Saturn, 
of its rings and of, uh, of its moons as well. But my favorite Cassini photo is not of the rings, it's not of, of the moon. My favorite Cassini photo is of Earth. So three years ago, when Cassini was on the back side of the ring planet, it turned its cameras inward and it imaged the inner solar system. Earth is in this field of view. Do you see it? <laughs> there we are, hidden in the rings of Saturn. And as the late astronomer Carl Sagan said, Earth, viewed from afar, is a pale blue dot. Doesn't this image make you feel tiny? Doesn't it make you feel alone? Doesn't it make you feel vulnerable? Earth is alone for hundreds of billions of kilometers, surrounded by nothing but the void of space. Within our solar system, we're the solitary oasis of intelligent life. And like Dr. Sagan, when I look at this image, I can contemplate that all of human history, everything that humans have ever learned, everything that we've experienced, everything that we will know, everyone whom I've ever loved, is on that isolated dot there. And it makes me more diligent in trying to preserve our existence. You know, I think that 100 years from now, humanity will still exist. But a thousand years from now, on our current trajectory, in our present mindset, I wouldn't bet on it. Some of the recent rhetoric and the posturing between nations worries me. When you consider the snail pace progress of humanity over the last millennia at great cost and effort, wouldn't it be foolish? Wouldn't it be irresponsible? Wouldn't it be the ultimate calamity if we cease to exist? at our own hands. You know, I hope that in the coming decades we will discover life elsewhere, you know, in our, in our galaxy. That would be mind-blowing, that'd be awesome, that'd be exciting, it would be the news event of the 21st century. But it could be that we're alone. It could be that we're it. The only intelligent life in the universe. Well, anyways, my wife was right, of course. Uh, I never returned back from space flight. <laughs> And uh, my perspectives and my priorities have certainly been influenced by, by my experiences. What's important to me today is not illegal immigration. It's not the travel expense claims of senators. It's not the affairs of the Kardashian family. <laughs> What's most important to me today, after having flown in space and looking down at the earth from space, is overpopulation, poverty, inequality, environmental damage. In other words, survival, survival of humanity, survival of, our, of nature. That's what I call signal. Much of the rest is noise. You know, I don't think I'm a better person because I've flown in space, but I think I am different. My wife, in fact, will argue that I'm more difficult to live with. <laughs> she says that with my head up there beyond the, the clouds, that it's more difficult to uh, engage me in some of the practical, important affairs of our, of our household. But the dawn of the space age, a half century ago, filled me with wonder, filled me with promise. Humanity was going to boldly go where we had never gone before. You know, exploration is a way of raising our thoughts from parochial, egocentric issues up to big picture, long-term global goals. It's ironic, you know, we go out into space, we venture out into space in order to learn about what's out there, but much of what we learn is about our home planet and about ourselves. I think every human being, every decision maker, would benefit from this orbital perspective. Thank you.